Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 7th. Today's topic is digital assessment tools. Our special guests are Madison District teachers. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. I will turn the microphone over to Peggy so that she can introduce our guests. Well, this is an exciting day for me. I am so proud to have some of my favorite teachers here with us today, sharing their stories and experiences about using digital assessment tools. Our special guest presenters are Kim Thomas, Ray Dewberry, Julie Leckman, and Jesse McKin McKinley, who are all teachers in the Madison School District in Phoenix, Arizona, which is just right down the street from me. Kim is the Tech Integration Facilitator for the district. Ray teaches Language Arts and Social Studies to 5th through 8th grade highly gifted students. Jesse teaches kindergarten through 4th grade general music. And Julie teaches 8th grade math. So we have an excellent representation across the curriculum for sharing with us today. I have been collaborating with and watching these amazing teachers teach for many years, and I am always so inspired by their enthusiasm and the joy of learning they bring to their students. What I love even more is their willingness to take risks, learn new things, and share them with others. As teachers, you all have great ideas and experiences that others can benefit from. And I am thrilled that these teachers, some of whom, they may not tell you this, but they have never shared in a webinar before. And they're taking that risk and sharing with us today. I know you're going to love hearing from them. And I hope you'll ask lots of questions in the chat for them to answer during the Q&A time. I'm going to just tell you a few things about Kim Thomas and she's going to answer our newbie question, and then she'll turn the presentation over to the team to introduce themselves as they begin their presentation. Well, Kim has been in education for 21 years. She's taught fourth through sixth grades. She's been a tech integration specialist for 15 years in the Madison School District for 13 of those years. And she created a program called MICE, which I just love the name of. And it stands for Madison Integrating Computer Education. So these folks with us today are part of the MICE program. She works with students and teachers in the classroom, both for teaching and planning. Kim is passionate about her work with students, and her eyes just sparkle when she shares about their latest adventures with technology. That she loves what she does is an understatement, and her enthusiasm is highly contagious. She loves attending online and face-to-face -face professional development to grow her PLN. And she'll tell you she has the cutest grandchildren in the world. Well, she says, well, maybe not the entire world, because all of us grandparents feel the same way. So with that, I'd like to move on to the newbie question and ask him to answer this and take us down this journey on digital assessments. So Kim, why do you think digital assessments are important in a classroom? Thank you, Peggy. There's a, a multitude of reasons, but first, there are plenty of free tools out there, and we love those free tools. And they're generally easy to create. As you're going to see what the teachers share with you today, that is true. It helps the students stay engaged and focused, and that, as we all know, is extremely important. And with using them as formative and even summative assessments, you can quickly gather information, data that can help guide your instruction. Best part, it can be fun for students and for teachers as well. Okay, you've already heard about um, our gang, um, the mice, and so I'm going to go ahead and slide on to the next one here. Um, Ray Dewberry, one of my favorite human beings on the face of this earth, um, that I have had the pleasure of working with for a number of years. I'm, I'm just going to go over a couple of things about each of these people and let them go on 
And when they start their slides, they'll do a little bit more in depth about themselves. Ray, we have bragging rights. She was just announced as um, the Gifted Teacher of the Year for Arizona, which is just makes us all pretty proud. So we get a woot woot for our friend Ray. Coming on a woot woot in the background. Um, and Jesse McKinley, uh, this young man. And is innovative in everything that he does. And he is also working in his master's on ed tech. So we get to talk about that stuff. So I get to talk geek with my friend Jesse. And you know about me, blah, blah, who cares. And down to Julie Lechman. This is a gal who's been with me in the MICE program since 2002. I consider her a very dear friend. She's also a published author. She has had, um, I believe, was her adapted curriculum in an uh, educational journal. And I'm sure that will be one of many that she'll be involved with. So I'm, I, I am thrilled to be here with my peeps. And I need to stop for just a moment and thank them for being risk takers. They are our leaders. They're the ones that help to inspire other teachers. And speaking of inspiring people, all of us here, before the show started, um, I have agreed that Peggy George is probably somebody that has touched the lives of so many of us. She is an inspiration to us. Um, and she. She has helped us with our leadership through her leadership to be better teachers in what we do in sharing information. So though Peggy is not part of this one, we really do want to say a thank you to Peggy as well. All right, I'm going to turn this over to my friend Ray Dewberry. And as she said, she's been roaming the air since the dinosaurs. I don't think so. So Ray, if you'll go ahead and click on the talk button, it is all yours, young lady. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, although this is my first time. So if I mess up, sorry. Uh, I have been teaching since the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, actually, about 1968 was my first year. I grew up in Michigan, a small town called Greenville near Grand Rapids. Went to the University of Michigan. Uh, taught in Michigan for a couple of years, and then I moved to Chicago. I don't know if you're aware of teaching salaries back in those dinosaur days, but I couldn't make a living as a teacher and had to go into the world of business. Um, I made a lot of money, but it was awful. Then I had the opportunity to get married, yay. I uh, had three wonderful children and was a full-time mom. However, I also kind of taught everything I could think of, never really got out of the teaching game. Um, what else do you need to know about me? I am very privileged to teach highly gifted students. They can be an interesting bunch, but they are also very innovative themselves. Uh, hmm. The program I'm sharing with you today is called Kahoot. It's free. Uh, all of my programs are free. I first heard this program next door last year. It was a student teacher that was running their students through a Kahoot. And I tell you, it was loud. I had to go over and see what was going on. I discovered that this tool really does have 100% engagement with the students. When they figure out that they are going to have a Kahoot at the end, they pay attention because they are so competitive and they want to win the game. Um, it has gotten to the point that my own students, when they present to the class, do their own cahoots because they love it. It's a quick, fun way to end a lesson. It's kind of a reward to the students for their hard work. Now, things I have learned, you need to keep these short. Ten questions is just about perfect. There is very loud and very annoying music that goes along with these. And if it's any longer than that, you'll go nuts. I've also learned recently that they have a public Kahoot bank. There, <laughs> last I checked last week, 3,975 Kahoots were available. Um, I, we were doing a final review of the novel Animal Farm. I found 22 different cahoots about dealing with Animal Farm. We also have been working a lot with analogies. I found 31 on analogies. So I have learned I don't have to do it myself. I can go to the public page. Now, this is kind of um, what you see. 
this is an advertisement, of course. Notice you can only create quizzes, but you also have discussions and surveys. So when you create a new Kahoot, you have a choice between a quiz, a discussion, or a survey. I'm going to admit at this point that I am <laughs> kind of stupid about a lot of things, and this is one of them that I depend on my students to teach me. Uh, when I introduce something like a Kahoot to them, it's their job to go out and learn all of the fire tips, come back and teach the teacher. I learn more from my students than I teach them every day. This is uh, it's a very easy process. I go to Kahoot if I'm going to make up a, a survey, but the students go to kahootit.com. Uh, when we are connected, uh, you see a game pin number. They log in, they connect, they type in their, their uh, pin number, and they create a nickname. Now, there's a thing here that says you want to set parameters for nicknames. I have to say that my students know they have to be politically correct when they do this. Also, the Kahoot itself does have a little disclaimer at the bottom that they will eliminate any names that are not appropriate, which is kind of nice. Um, I also have never had any trouble on any of the devices that my students bring in. We are a BYOD, bring your own device school, and my students do bring in their phones, their tablets, etc. Never have we had a problem yet that may change, who knows. This is what shows up on the launch page. This was the Animal Farm Review, actual picture of my classroom. Uh, and I launched at the launch button. Uh, and this is what the students see when they get in. There's a question up at the top. What is Kahoot? Only the question is there. And then they have four choices, or three choices. You determine how many choices they have. They have to click on the choice that they think is the correct answer. There are 16 students in this Kahoot. You can see that number over on the left. And as they answer, the zero on the right uh, shows every time somebody clicks in an answer. Now, the problem my students have with this is that they are scored not only for a correct answer, but how quickly they can get their answer in. And my students get so excited that they often click the wrong answer. Oops. It teaches them to be precise. This is a, uh, this is a picture of some of my students. You can see this is, we're just getting ready to start. This guy can't even sit down. He's so excited. And you can see the engagement of all of them. Then we come here after we find out the results of that question. And you can see this one is very, very unhappy young man in the front. You can see some fist bumps up at the top because they got right answers. And you can see uh, in the second photo on the right, the student standing up ready to throw something at the screen because he lost. Oh, well. Oh, whoops, sorry about that, Julie. Um, I'm going to take just a moment now to turn this over to Julie. I'm going to go ahead and add, or advance that slide. Julie, bless her heart, being an overachiever, has agreed to present not one, but two resources. Um, you're going to love them. So Julie, uh, don't forget to talk a little bit about yourself, if you would, please. I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Um, can you guys hear her? I can't. Okay. No. Make Let's sure it again. Can you hear me now? There we go. All, All right. right, great. Um, I do not have an exciting background. I'm kind of a boring person. I love mathematics. Uh, that pretty much between mathematics and technology consumes a lot of my time. Um, and I, I like looking for technology tools. I've been looking um, right after the dinosaurs were um, extinct on the planet. I've been looking around for technology. Being a math teacher um, and embracing technology, it's been kind of a frustrating road for me. Uh, a lot of tools when 2.0 came out were language arts driven or social studies driven. The idea of technology for math has always been 
pretty much use a graphing calculator. In the last couple of years, we've seen things really, really change, so I'm kind of excited um, about what we're going to talk about today. Um, I can tell you that um, I started using Socratic a number of years ago. I was not crazy about it because um, I couldn't put in equations, I couldn't put in radical signs or um, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop there, fractions. So I kind of keep checking in with Socratic and what I'm finding is that um, it's, it's evolved. It's more accessible for everyone. I like formative assessment. I like it embedded in my lesson. Um, so I happen to use Socratic a lot for what is called quick questions. I'm going to show you what a quick question, I'm going to show you what Socratic looks like as we're going through so you kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, let me launch this larger. All right. So there are multiple kinds of quizzes that you can create. This is a launch page. This is where you would um, have your students begin, or this is where you would launch your, your assessments. Let me back up. Also, what's really important is this lovely little room number. If you are a teacher and you're using technology, I'm sure you're familiar with trying to create bit.lys to get kids to assessments or to a web page. One of the nice things about Socratic is my room number will never change. So after I've given a couple of assessments, the kids, when I say go to Socratic, know exactly what number and what links to go to to go in. I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Um, I do more formative than summative assessments with online tools. If you look here, starting a quiz, um, those are more traditional, kind of A, B, C, D, or a fill in the blank kind of a question. Oops. This one right here, the quick question, I absolutely adore. Um, I may be presenting a new math concept. I'll build into my lecture, lesson, smart board, questions that allow me to decide what route I'm taking in teaching the math concept. I want to know what, where the kids are in their understanding. Now, in the old days, it would be like, OK, how many of you understand? Is everybody comfortable with where we're at? Put your hand up. Now it's kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs to the side. Unfortunately, students learn over time to be very deceptive, and if everybody's hand goes up and they don't understand, they're going to put their hand up too, and it doesn't give me the feedback that I need. A quick question allows me to see exactly how many of my students are getting the concept. Their students are a little more likely to be honest. Um, I found that, that I can stop right there and reteach some of the concepts or build on where the students aren't understanding. So the questions may be on my smart board, um, and, and sorry, on my smart board, the students would answer the questions. I'm going to show you some images in just a minute. Um, or with a quick question, I can kind of see that deer and headlight look on my students' faces. I can verbally deliver a question that came, up, came to me on the spot, use a quick question, and the students can answer it right then and there, again, giving me more feedback. The space race, I like using um, more publicly. Uh, with the start a question, I don't really let the, or start a quiz. I don't really share the results with the students. That's really more for me, like a, maybe a Friday quiz or a Wednesday checkup. The quick questions, I don't usually share those with the kids either. Again, trying to get a more honest answer out of the students. The space race, however, um, I like and the kids like. I post questions. Um, into Socratic, and then the students are set up in teams, and they're competing against each other in teams, and they can see the result. Not only does it um, engage the kids, as the Kahoot did, because they can see the, the who's winning the race, so to speak, but I think something that's really important um, is it begins to teach students how to self self-assess where they're at in their understanding of the math concept because they can see uh, that they're not the only one that is, is confused or that they're really kind of missing the boat. I'm going to exit out of here for just, just a minute. And I'm going to come back to... Um, 
one of the advantages in using Socratic is the way that the feedback comes to you. Um, here's the space race that we were talking about. You can see, whoops, you probably can't see my cursor. Let me go get my, my lovely arrow. So if you look right here, you'll see um, I had broken the kids into two groups here, a blue team and a magenta team. You don't really get to pick the color, but the kids can see right here. This is what shows up on my smart board, and they can see how they're doing. Um, forces them to be a little more collaborative. Poor magenta team didn't do very well. A quick question would be up here. Um, again, I'm the one who's seeing it, but you can see very clearly that my students, whatever concept it was that I was teaching that day, very clearly understood the correct answer. Um, and we had a few stragglers. And this is where I can go and grab those students for um, small groups. The results that you get from um, Socrative can also be, for the test questions, very informative as grouping. Not only do I see how my students are doing, you can see by color really fast the student totally failed. Um, these students completely nailed it. But I can also go in and look at the item analysis. So I can say, OK, what was question number one that, for example, five? I'd be looking at question number five. What was it that they missed? How do I change my um, instruction tomorrow so that I'm meeting the needs of those students? I use it more globally than versus giving students individual scores on an assessment. Because for me, it's formative and it's informing my um, my uh, instruction, sorry. Um, some of the kids, I'm going to show you some pictures of the kids working. And I'm going to actually, whoops, actually give you a little bit more information. Um, one of the nice things, one of the downfalls, let me back up. One of the downfalls of using Socratic is it doesn't have a question bank. A lot of the formative tools online now have a question bank. And unfortunately, Kahoot does not. However, if you use the template, it is in an Excel spreadsheet. And you can design your questions in Excel, save those questions, build a event bank, um, and you can create your own bank on an Excel sheet and just keep it in a folder on your desk. That way, when you go to create a question, you can pull that information or you can uh, and, and cut and paste it into your question. Or you can simply delete the questions you don't want out of the spreadsheet. Obviously, save a new copy. You don't want to lose those questions and upload it. Another great thing that I like about this is if you work in a department and you have two or three teachers, you can share Kahoot with another group of teachers. So you can all give the same formative assessment at the same time. Um, just a tip, I found that um, with any kind of online assessment, students tend to think it's like the games they play or the chat, and they really, you need to remind them to use pencil and paper if you're giving them a math question. Um, again, another thing that I like is um, I am in Whoops, why is my picture? There we go. I am in a blended um, classroom like Ray. You'll notice tablet, tablet, phone. Um, they do have an, uh, an app for the teacher and the student so the kids can access it very quickly. As a side note, I'm going to do bragging rights, these lovely little tablets that are provided here. Um, I wrote a grant for. Um, tablets last year to um, ASTI, which is the Arizona Tech um, Association, and to CenturyLink, which is a uh, communications company here. And received the tablets, could not have lived without them. Absolutely love in integrating it in math. You can see that the kids are highly engaged. Some of them are using paper. Uh, but nobody's wandering around. You can see. We're, we're getting it done, and they're all engaged, even my lovely ladies who tend to back out of math. They're right there in the mix and fighting for their scores. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about Answer Garden. Um, if you've ever used, um, what am I trying to think of, Wordle, this is kind of a Wordle, but kind of not. It is, a for me, a quick visual, for the kids, a quick visual um, formative assessment. What it does is um, I pose a question. I do use Bitly to shorten up the link for these guys. Um, I pose a question, um, how do you know um, that a function you're looking at is a linear? The st students would begin putting in their responses in 
right here where it says type your answer. And it starts generating a Wordle. So I know the bigger the word gets, the more the students are familiar with that concept. Um, there is a limited time that you can leave your um, answer garden up online. You can leave it up, I think, maximum for a week, and the students go in, can go in and review it or can go in and add to it. Um, at the end, I usually take, just take a screenshot. Um, but I mean, if you're standing there and you're teaching and you're seeing that uh, you're asking students about linears and they're putting in the word curve, you know you have a big problem and you've done something wrong. Uh, and it happens in math. Um, it's nice. I like using QR codes. You can access this using a QR code. It puts the kids right in. There is no account needed. You can keep it private so that other people can't get in since you're working with students. Um, you can not block a user, however. You can moderate this so that if Johnny is your fun kid in the back of the room who likes to use expletives, um, you always can block that before it hits your answer garden. Um, so it, this is just a really super quick, easy four minute for you. Um, I know we're going to have questions later on, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce to you Jesse McKinley, who's going to talk to you about clickers. Thank you, Julie. I am super, super honored and, and excited to share with you what clickers are. Um, a little background about myself. Um, I am a K-4 general music teacher, and um, I am from Wisconsin. Um, and I got out of Wisconsin because I had 26 years of snow, and I said enough was enough. So once I graduated from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota, I headed down south. And um, like uh, Kim Thomas said, I am working on my master's in uh, ed, ed tech. And I also have another master's from ASU, uh, Arizona State University, in elementary education. So um, you might be wondering, why is this music teacher talking about technology? Well, I've had such a great experience and um, kind of love for technology, um, kind of ever since I was a, a student uh, a student worker at, at uh, St. Cloud State. I used to be a, a, a web designer, a graphics uh, artist, and desktop publisher for the um, Affirmative Action Office in a, at St. Cloud State University. So I think that kind of um, love for Technology and uh, design kind of kind of sparked a little hobby of of technology and, and how it's applied in in um, the classrooms. So, um, Plickers is this really cool kind of augmented reality um, uh, tool uh, to assess students. Um, it's a it's a very formative assessment tool, uh, and it's actually and it's free. It's so 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 free. Um, it, uh, you can use your mobile device um, uh, to, um, to administer surveys, ass assessments, um, polls. It's a very user-friendly uh, tool. Um, and it also integrates paper, <laughs> which I thought was kind of a really neat idea, too, um, for a digital tool to use paper. Uh, so what happens is that uh, you print out these cards that have QR codes. And uh, the QR codes have letters all around the sides um, for students to make their choice. And um, the teacher uh, scans in the code for whatever the student um, um, is showing. Um, and, and the teacher can see through augmented reality who has it right, who has it wrong on their device. It's, it, it's really simple. And, um, and who needs, um, also who needs help on the content. Um, it is web-based, web and again, like I said, it's free. Free 99 is such a great deal for teachers. Um, I learned this uh, last year, towards the end of the 2014-2015 school year, and I kind of don't remember if it was mentioned in a blog or if I saw a posting on Facebook, because you know how Facebook wants to throw everything at you that you're interested in. And um, I heard it or read, through, read about it from, um, uh, from some blog, and it was just a, a, a neat idea, an interesting idea. To, to use in the classroom. And again, it, just, it was just so simple and so easy. Um, it, um, I tried out my fourth grade uh, kids before the end of the school year, and I just saw their light, their eyes just light up um, of the engagement, um, uh, the, um, them being engaged into the, in the content. And, it was, and I used a fun question. It was like, what is your favorite ice cream? And, and uh, 
they they were just so hooked on it about this you know holding the card and getting the getting or showing their answer and, and showing what they know and also seeing the results after the polling was done um, just to see like oh wow we all said this or oh we had two people said chocolate and one person said vanilla and everyone said strawberry like oh this is so cool so I from there I said I've got to implement this into this year um, this year's um, curriculum so um, I use clickers uh, to check for understanding um, as an icebreaker you know that um, uh, the uh, non-content, uh, non-academic content to kind of break the ice in the beginning of the school year. Um, I use it as a hook before the lesson to gauge what the students know or don't know. Um, I use it to vote and to poll the class and to um, also I use it for evaluation um, of a performance. Uh, what I use, uh, how I use Plickers is after our performance we watch the video of the students performing. Then I have four questions. Um, geared to um, are you were the performers singing on pitch? Did they start and stop together with the group with the uh, conductor? Was the audience uh, behavior appropriate? Because I also want them to go back to their parents and say, hey, we noticed parents talking when our when we we're performing. You're not supposed to be doing that. So I want them to kind of be taking some ownership of of um, you know expectations and etiquette. Um, and then they. Um, I, I, I pull them of, of how they think, their opinions. So there's no right or wrong answers. Um, I pull them and, uh, and it shows up there, the, the results on, on the screen for them. Um, why I use it, it's like I said, super, super fun and it's engaging. Uh, the students take ownership of their answers since no one is hiding and that's a really cr um, critical thing I think um, uh, Julie mentioned. There's no, there's no shy students. Everybody is exposed. Um, I can quickly identify students uh, that I need to pull to the side to to, um, to reteach um, to, in a small group, um, or then I can move on. Or as like I, I like to say, I can determine um, if I stay or if I go. <laughs> um, it's uh, also um, why I use it. It's instant feedback. Um, I see the students pop up on my phone um, because it's a. It's also there's also an app. That you download to um, to uh, scan in their codes on your phone, and it's also the phone. Uh, the app is um, uh, Android and um, iOS um, compatible, so you can get both versions um, for uh, for either phone. So I scan their um, their cards in. They're, they pop up whether they got the answer right or they got the answer wrong, or if, if they answered or not. And then I can pull those students aside and say. Okay, this is the concept that you got wrong. Here's what we what we've learned. This is the um, this is the, the the way that this is what you should should remember. Or you know, this is a wrong concept that you've got in your head. Here's the right concept, and then repull them again, uh, and then we can move on to the next concept. Uh, let's see. Next slide. <laughs> um, some tips and tips and tricks about uh, using um, the program uh, clickers. When you download, and I and I sh I'll show the, some screenshots of the um, of the program actually in use and 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 the program being used with um, the students. Um, you uh, buy either the uh, or you print out different types of um, cards. You can print cards out from the website itself, or you can go to I think Amazon.com and print them or buy them um, laminated and and such. And uh, but definitely buy different sizes and different uh, different or print out different sizes of cards. Um, they, they're small ones and there's large ones because you never know when you need to modify based on the kind of group you have. Like with kinders, I would not use small cards. Uh, use, the, the, use the large um, one sheet page uh, cards uh, that, that they have available. And I, um, I also uh, have some uh, kindergarten teachers that um, have used this and they've actually wrote on their bigger letters for the for the little kids to or for the little kinders to to uh, work with, and also I've had actually a situation where I had a class set of 30, and we had parents come in, and we were doing clickers, and I thought what a we what a neat way to show the, the parents what we're doing with technology in the music room, like oh technology in the music room, oh mind blown, so I had cards printed out or extra cards. Um, printed out for them for them to use, and they were really like, "Wow, where where can I get this? What can I? Uh, how can I use this at home?" Like, really? 
cool. Here's the website. Here's here's the all the information I know. Um, go for it. Um, so uh, the other one is um, you can laminate these, but um, please uh, try to uh, uh, find a matte finish uh, of the lamination. Or uh, we've also had suggestions of finding paper um, protectors that are in matte finish um, because the, the the glossy shine does um, affect the scanning of the card. Um, or if you have a print shop, um, uh, access to a print shop uh, in your district, uh, have them print in matte uh, format or matte finish. Organize, organize, organize right away. Um, it is you can uh, the questions are user created. There is no bank of questions. I think they keep it kind of flexible and easy because if you have your own questions to use, you don't have to be tied to someone else's um, um, work, which may or may not support what, what you're doing in your curriculum or in your district. So they give you the flexibility of creating your own uh, questions and surveys. Um, but organize, organize, organize. Um, right away, it's easy to get lost in the hundreds and thousands of questions you've created um, in your content or for your classes. And the really cool thing is you can organize um, uh, in Flickr, uh, a new feature is that you can organize by uh, libraries. Uh, there's a library section you can or organize your questions by content, by class, by uh, day if you like, if you feel like it. You can, there's, there's a wide range of um, flexibility. Um, plan ahead when the network is down or sell your, sell your service is, uh, is spotty. Uh, I threw that in there because in my classroom I have a very big dead zone in my room. Um, I use my phone and I use my cellular phone. Um, we, we are a BYOB uh, district and um, the network sometimes works and sometimes, sometimes does not work um, depending on how the network feels, I guess. <laughs> I think it's a, a little entity inside that's kind of dictating all this. So I go to my cellular, um, cellular service or uh, so use my cellular da data since I have unlimited and I like data. <laughs> But in my room, there's this huge dead zone, and the only place I can use clickers is the stage door about a foot in onto the stage. And I think uh, Kim Thomas saw me one time at the, at the back of the room using the clickers and scanning and kind of looked at me like, why are you over there? Like, this is the only spot I can get cellular service. So, um, but uh, just like all, with all any technology, you definitely plan ahead because things happen, the monkey wrench gets thrown into plans, and you have to quickly find an alternative. Um, students uh, that move in or out of the class or out of district can be archived. So you can, there's an archive folder where you can say, uh, put their, um, put their um, not their saved information, but their, their name and stuff, because I know that's a pain when a student comes in, they're here for a week, and then they're gone, and then they come back, and then they're gone, and they do the stands. And it's like, okay, I've got two weeks or five weeks of, uh, of stuff here that you've uh, kind of missed and not missed. But typing in your name every time you come and go, it's, it's getting kind of a pain. So you can easily archive them into an archive folder so that when they come back, they can just pop their name back in uh, into the system. All right. so. Here is a picture of clickers in action, and um, I, I was trying to get more pictures because a lot of teachers in our in our school are starting to use this more. They're starting to see the, the benefit of, of using clickers, and it's a, a it's an easy uh, way to um, to get assessment um, information or uh, data from 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 students, and a cheap way because you don't have to buy clickers um, uh, or equipment. It's just paper and your tablet or phone with the web app um, with the application on there. So in kindergarten, you can see the picture right. Oops, my pointer here. Here, that there's a. Uh, um, they have the card on a on a board, uh, a white board, a white board, and the teacher put their name on it um, and um, put the letters all around for the different choices that they can choose. And yes, kindergarten the kindergartners are using these. <laughs> and in the music room, you can see right here, I've got them set up in on on the rugs here. They're um, uh, the, the cards are all different kind, uh, all different um, QR codes. So no, uh, no card is the same. 
uh, and that helps uh, you know, differentiate from the students. So the you know the same student doesn't have the the same number or the same card. And um, in my procedure is that uh, they hold it with two hands. They hold it in the front of their face, and um, they are not to touch the card, the code, so it uh, so it doesn't um, uh, mess up with the scanning. And um, in the background here, there's my smart board, my interactive board, and it shows the question that they're on. And when I click a button to reveal the answer, it shows who got it right, who got it wrong, and also shows a, a bar graph of, uh, of the percentage of who got it right and who got it wrong. All right, and the next uh, couple of slides, the two slides are the uh, screenshots of the uh, of the uh, program itself. So the first thing uh, to get started is you create your free educator account and you go to Plickers.com. Uh, very, very simple um, uh, login or uh, uh, creation um, uh, screen. Your, uh, it gives you your, uh, you log in, you put your classes, um, uh, name your classes, excuse me, um, the year, uh, the subject, I think the year means like grade that they're in, like first grade, second grade, third grade, um, and that stuff. And then you can also assign a class color. I use the class colors definitely in my room because we have a lot of first grade, a lot of kindergartners, a lot of uh, third grade classes, and I want to keep them separate from each other uh, because certain questions are, should be assigned to certain classes. And then once, you're, uh, once you've got your uh, classes created, um, this is what the screen looks like um, when you when you log in. When when you've got your account and you've logged in, you have your classes listed down below, and they're all color coded. And you can also add more if uh, in the future you want to separate um, uh, some kids and have a higher group or low group. You can separate them and in, in, into um, another group or another class. Two more minutes. Oh, okay. I'm moving quickly. And here's what the class here's what the class looks like. What's really cool about this is that um, these numbers don't necessarily have to stay with the students. You can interchange them out. So if you have a student that hey, I want number 44 or uh, 34, you can switch their number out for 34 if that makes them happy, makes them more engaged. Um, you can. Uh, Enter the students here by cut and paste from you know from uh, um, from Excel um, or from Word if you have your class list in that kind of format. Um, you can have them with just first names or with last names or with both. And then on the bottom here is uh, the live view version uh, or the live view live view screenshot of the uh, of the application, and that's where the questions pop up and um, the charts and um, uh, who answered and who hasn't answered and who's got it right and who didn't get it right. So, um, oh, and this is what the questions look like too. And like I said, it can run on um, on your uh, smartphone or on a tablet. Uh, it's iOS or Android uh, compatible, and um, and that's what you're going to see uh, uh, on your on your device. The questions and who. Has it right, and another neat thing about uh, when you create uh, questions is that you can add pictures too. That's a really neat feature that they've added, and hopefully they'll add more features like video or putting pictures in the answer box. They are, um, they have a, a a page or a blog that for um, suggestions to continually improve the um, application. And I believe I am done. Um, as I. As I mentioned in the chat, um, Jesse is our Plickers expert, and I just I could not be proud of these guys. I have learned so much from these guys. Somewhere along the line, somebody said I was the leader of this group. That is so not true. I follow in their footsteps. We saved the last one for Google Forms, and because most of you are aware of what Google Forms are, so I'm going to do this, the condensed version, in about five minutes, because I do want to leave time for questions. This this chat has been so rich in questions and comments that I, I want to make sure we save time to honor so we can ask these experts their opinions as well. So we're going to dive into Google Forms. Um, I'm going to work on the assumption, and you know what they say about that, but I'm still going to work on the assumption that most of you have used Google Forms. And I'm going to go ahead and just skip over some things because you know that 
the variety of things you can do with Google Forms. Of course, we're going to focus on give um, student quizzes. And so we're going to look at the different types of questions. And I've just listed that down here. To be honest, and I've been using Google Forms for a couple of years, I have stuck with the text, the paragraph, multiple choice, and check box, and choose from a list. I don't do the other four very often, just because I really haven't had a need for that. I started using them when I was um, teaching classes, catnip classes. Yes, catnip to go with the mice, it's all there. And um, I use it to collect feedback from teachers. Now, this is the first one you're going to see is when I'm building it, and you can jazz it up. I just wanted you to have a visual of what it can look like. And the beauty of this is once that information is collected, it automatically goes to a spreadsheet. So ta-da, there it is. Now, you've got it in your Google spreadsheet. And you can manipulate it there. But if you're more of an Excel expert and there's more you want to do, you can download that Excel spreadsheet or that, that Google spreadsheet into Excel. So you have that. Um, they, a couple of years ago, they added images that you could bring in and video as well. Now in Madison, we're pretty progressive, but we don't allow YouTube videos. Color commentary will be following later. But as a teacher, I can use that and show the class. But we can add images, which is really a great visual for so many. I know I'm visual. That can spark a conversation, or it could be a story starter. It could be anything. So once again, I'm showing you what it looks like behind the scene and what the finished product can look like. Now, so why use Google Forms? Because they can do a formal or an informal um, question or quiz that you can do absolutely on the fly. This is my favorite part. I can do that. I can do a quiz, and there's no papers to log home. But you're not only saving your fees, you're saving your back for those teachers that have those all the papers to take home. And they're easy to create. You can add images and video. They're easy to edit. And you can customize so you can differentiate. You could have a quiz, but you could have three quizzes that have been just changed just a slight bit to meet the needs of the students in that particular classroom. And sharing the forms, it's easy. You can either share directly to a person by embedding it in an email, or you can just share the link. And we do have a middle school teacher that is using this in his social studies classroom, because we are a BYOD district. And teachers are now finding their way with BYOD. This is one of the tools that they are bringing in. Drawbacks, it's limited in what you can do. Guys, it's Google, it's free. You get over it, OK? That's what I said to myself. There's no rich text, so I can't do anything fancy. The thing I like most is I never give up, because when I go in and create one, I still try to do that, thinking Google will be listening. So it, all, the li all the drawbacks, there's just a couple. This is my very favorite part about Google Forms. And as you've heard from the other teachers with students creating them as well, um, the, the students can be creating them. I uh, worked with a teacher in regards to Kahoot. Well, we did one. The kids loved it. It was a seventh grade classroom. We said, hey, this is great. But why are you even thinking of creating them? You can have your students create them. Her seventh grade students worked in teams every week. And they had to write up four students, had to create a Kahoot, give it to the class. The class crit did the Kahoot, critiqued the questions used in the Kahoot, and then they had to turn in the results to the teacher. Same thing can be done with Google Forms. The students can create that, then take that Google spreadsheet with the information, and they can get that to the teacher. And you can also consider using Flubberoo. That can, I love, don't you love that name? It sounds like what I did earlier in the chat when I was trying to spell the word shucks. Um, Flubberoo is an auto grade for your assessment in Google Forms. What I have done here, being a true Peggy George disciple here, I know to quote my sources. So Alice Wheeler, remarkable, all the stuff. It's got it all in there. And then Eric Kurtz provides a lot of stuff, but he also walks you through Flubberoo. So I, once again, these are the two you really, really do want to look at and consider. I did it in five minutes. Um, I, sorry, I have to stop and pat myself on the back, because being an administrator, I very seldom keep anything under five minutes. So if we can go ahead, and um, I'm going to close out my mic, and Lori or whoever's going to handle the, the questions to us, um, we've got five minutes to cover some of those questions. Thanks so much, everyone. I did gather questions as we went along. Going back up to Kahoot, um, this was one that possibly was answered in the chat. Um, Someone had used Kahoot for face-to-face. -face. Can it run asynchronously when kids are not in one place? 
like Socrates can? No. No. Are you okay. that No. Answer. Good. <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this was also Kahoot, and I think it was also addressed about questions don't appear on the iPhone, just the colored shapes. Is that the way it works on mobile? That you just get the shapes? Correct. Okay. Um, uh, do you use any of these for grades? Okay, this one's I, gonna go out to everybody, so I'm just gonna they'll turn their their turn to talk. I'll shut up. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't use it for grades. Uh, I use it for just a quick formative assessment. Um, just to make sure kids are paying attention, etc. Really, mm -hmm. this is used mostly by my students uh, to other students. My students are creating their own cahoots every time they give a presentation. Um, it's very impressive, actually. But no, I do not use it for grades. I think you probably could. I'm just not sure how. Most of my grades are essays, so what can mm -hmm. I tell you? Okay. Any other feedback about using these for grades from the panel? I, I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it really depends on what the content is. Um, mm -hmm. If I choose to use them as grades, if I'm doing a, a, a quick, um, like a quick question or uh, whatever, I don't put those in the grades. Again, that's more for my information. However, with the um, quizzes, I, I, I might use them for grades, but whenever I do, I let the kids know before I give them the assessment so mm -hmm. uh, the kids know. But um, again, it really depends on, on, on the purpose. I mean, you're never going to give them grades on a pre-assessment. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't give it to them while it's embedding because, in my opinion, they're still learning and it's not a gotcha kind of thing. Um, if I choose to use it as a quick formative on a Friday, then and the kids know, you bet I put the grades in. I um, don't use this for grades, but I do use this for um, participation. You you could use this for grades. However, the the question would be, well, how valid would the um, the results be for for them? Because the kids are looking at each other. They're kind of everyone sees everyone's answers, and it's really easy for them to uh, switch answers before mm -hmm. I scan them. So um, I I do it more for participation, and it's a formative. So it's it's to help me guide the discussion, help guide guide the lesson. Are they getting the concept, or are they not not getting the concept? Who's getting it? Who's not getting it? Do I stay on, or do I go to the next thing? Mm -hmm. And there was a, a Plickers question specifically. Um, can Plickers questions be posted for the class to see without the answer being shown? I don't believe so because then there's no nothing to scan. Okay. So, well, the, uh, let me. You can use it for like to get opinions, um, but there has to be something for them to answer or to find something for them to scan. Okay, and how do you know who does get the answer with Plickers? With Plickers on the device that you're scanning with, it shows up either red or green. Okay. Um, if they got the answer right, it's green. If they didn't get it right, it's red. If, they, if you have no um, answer assigned to the choices, then it's blue, and it's more of an opinion or a okay. poll. Um, is it hard to pick up all the responses in a large class with clickers? This person was wondering if there are any glitches or if sometimes certain cards don't register. I, I'm pointing at Jesse saying, I want to take this one because we were doing it with our mice group one day. Mm -hmm. And Jesse said, uh, you don't have to go that slow, Kim. Well, I have about 24 people in here. And I looked at him going, geez, Jesse. So I went faster. It picked it up that quick, and that was mm -hmm. just in Jesse's direction. So, Jesse, if you have anything else, I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah, I, uh, it, it, Plicker says you can do, uh, you can get up to 40, or up uh, between 40 and 60. And
And depending on the size of class um, size or you know air arena that you have, um, if you're doing like in a large lecture hall, you need the, the large card to pick up the to pick up the code. If you're in a small classroom, then the small cards would be fine. Um, and, and it, it was to, back to the um, uh, uh, tip I, that I mentioned: um, buy different types or make different types of cards because you never know what situation you're going to be into. Mm -hmm. I hope oh. that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I think it did. Um, I'm just trying to scan through these to see what I've asked and what I haven't. Um, there was one about Socrates here. I, I actually think I, I wrote the question down. I think I saw it in the feed, and I believe it was from KJ that she wanted to know in the high school classroom what right, do you do with it. plus 50 kids. Um, I'm going to go back to the screen share. I don't know, KJ, whether you're asking me. Um, oops, I'm sorry. I don't know if you're asking me. Uh, how am I want to want to think about this? I don't you know if you're asking account, me. student accounts for Socrates. I'm sorry, I'm I trying to focus on getting back to the show. Uh, I don't know if you're asking me if you have 50 kids in one classroom, what do I do, or if I have multiple classrooms. But if you go into managing um, your quizzes and you want to, I'll go to my quizzes. So here's some of the uh, quizzes. I mean, I've got tons of them. I'm not going into all of them. But if you had um, students in a class that was bigger than 50, what you can do is duplicate your test and give um, a, a quiz, uh, set up a quiz for 10 minutes and have group A take it. So if I duplicate it, let's go in and, and see I can change the name. So I can edit the name and I could say group one, group two. I can also do this for the period. So if I have seven periods, I can go in and say they're getting the exact same quiz in two seconds. All I have done is changed it to period two and they can do it. Again, if, you're, if you've if you got 60 kids in a classroom, I personally would break them into two groups. Um, I'd give group A one and I'd give group B one. Yes, you would have to run them you know, not together at the same time. Uh, group A for the first 15 minutes, Group B for the second 15 minutes, and simply change, their na change the name of your quiz and assign the quiz time. Say, OK, Group A, take it. Group A, close out, or simply close them out, because kids will take as long as you give them. Mm -hmm. And then say, OK, Group B, now it's your turn. And since the scores and the questions aren't seen by everybody, it, it should not be a problem. I hope that answered your question. I think it did. Thanks very much for that. Um, this person was interested to know if BYOD creates privileged versus non-privileged equity issues in education. These are all great resources, but how can there be equitable access with BYOD, e.g., those without digital device left behind? All right, so we're all going crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can hear Julie in the background. They're all looking at yes. me like, I want to answer this one. It, <laughs> it is a whole kettle of fish, guys. At, but the reality of it is in education, and if you're in Arizona, there is not appropriate funding. I know. Mm -hmm. You're shocked if you haven't kept up with the news in Arizona. <laughs> Sorry about the background noise there. But this is the district wanted to be able to get more tools in students' hands. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to one of the teachers here, I'm getting the, the hand over there, and <laughs> let them address it. We'll keep it short, but let them address it because it is their opinion, and we, we need to value that. So I'm going to turn it over to Ju Jesse. Okay, Jesse. Sure, okay. thank you. So in our school, we, have a, we are a Title I school, which means we have a high population that are on free and reduced um, lunch, mm -hmm. and um, high minority students. And yes, the parents um, are, are kind of struggling um, with this. I think some of the, the, the workarounds is, with this is finding digital tools that do not necessarily use, have a lot of technology use, like AKA clickers. It's your mobile device or your tablet, and it's paper cards that they are using. Right. Um, so, um, but, the, but also to answer the inequalities, we've um, come up with kind of a plan uh, as teachers that um, if, if a student does not have um, access at home or have the, the tools for to use it in, in, in the school to either work to work with um, working on grants, running um, funding for 
uh, devices that we can house in our school so that they can use. So we've come up with uh, Chromebooks. We've come up with um, grants. Like, like Julia mentioned, she wrote a grant for 25, five, a lot of tablets. <laughs> For um for classroom use, um, you know, going to Doina's shoes, putting up um, you know, the 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 call for that, um mm -hmm. for that for that uh for those devices. So um it it's kind of plowing through that that bridge so that it is equitable for everyone to use. Um and also and that's I think that's my thing first I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hand raise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, but I think I, I think the point is that that um, as teachers, we're we're trying to build that bridge so that bridge connects to everyone for equality and for um, for everybody to have use. Great, thank you. Uh, one suggestion was what Jesse mentioned: was donors choose. There are other places like that to get funding for materials. Mm. All right, those those were the questions that I captured. I'm not sure if there are any others or if I know Alan still has his hand up. Alan, are, do you want to get on the mic at this point to share or do you have a question you want to ask with the mic since you have your hand up? Okay, you now have the mic, Alan. Oh, on the talk button it is the upper left hand corner, right under the audio and I video. Got it. Yay. I got it. Great, thanks. But it's been too long. Actually, I was gonna say that Jesse's response really triggered me when he said the word Chromebook, that maybe that's the, the kind of um mental bridge that we need to make nationally in education that you know, we've spent X number of dollars on textbooks all these years. Maybe it's time for the quote digital books to just be the standard which would then address equity which says you know we'll give you budgets now for the digital books if you want to get textbooks that maybe that's going to be the privileged districts getting quote textbooks but at least everybody can have access to the digital books now thanks so much I think that wraps up our questions. So I'm going to um, turn the. Can I make one last comment, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. I just want to publicly thank all my Madison peeps again for taking time out of their Saturday morning, not including all the time they did to get this prepped. So thanks to my Madison peeps. I get a woot woot, and that's it. <laughs>Again, thanks so much. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will talk about our upcoming shows. Thank you so much. You all shared just enough to make us want more. So I need you to start thinking about other ways that you can share with us, and we'll have you back another time. This was excellent. I just got so many great ideas, and the practical tips you gave are very helpful. So thanks to all of you. OK, for next week, we have decided we're going to try another open mic show. We haven't done this in a while, but everyone loved it so much. And I need you to stay with me for just about two minutes more, because I want your input on what the best topic would be. So take a look at this slide. Just quickly scan it and think about something, maybe something we haven't done a webinar before, or just something that you're really interested in learning about 
and sharing about. And I'm going to ask you to do a vote by raising your hand. So think about these, these topics. Um, maybe productivity tools for teachers. What are you using to make your job more efficient? Communicate with parents, that kind of thing. Any video tools and apps in the classroom? Live streaming tools. I know quite a few people are starting to use Periscope. I happen to love Blab. But there's YouTube, there's Facebook, there's live stream, there's Ustream. We can have just a show on that. PBL projects, maybe for one topic area, like social studies, science, math, or English language arts. Maybe tools for differentiating for special needs students. Flipped learning. We've done some on that, but we could sure do more. Um, ways to use social media with our students. Could be Twitter, could be Facebook, but could be blogs, lots of different things. Ed camps, would you like to know more about them? What they are, examples from different camps, how to organize and prepare for one. Maybe parent engagement and involvement strategies and stories. And what happens in an open mic show is we just ask some um, guiding questions, and then anyone in the room can either get on the microphone to share their idea share their link, or they can share in the chat. And it's sort of like a, almost like a lightning round that you might see um, maybe at a, at a conference or um, an ed camp that you might go to. And we just all take turns sharing. And then all those resources go into the live binder for that session. So let's, let's <laughs> I haven't had a chance to look at the notes. I see some people said flip, flip learning, multimodal learning. Um, oh, grab uh, ideas for fundraising and grants might be another topic. So it's so hard to know. OK, I'm going to quick go down these. And this is going to be a, a, a challenge for you. But I want you to raise your hand when I ask the topic. And then uh, that count will be recorded in the recording. And I can go back and uh, pick the most popular one. So raise your hand by clicking on that hand for productivity tools for teachers. How many of you would like that to be the topic? Just raise your hand. See how the little number appears by your hand? That's great. So I'm getting a good sense of how many of you like that. And you don't have to pick just one. So if there are several that you're interested in, you can vote again. OK. I'm going to lower your hands. Let's see. Um, here, in fact, Lori, will you do that? Lower the hands for me, and I'll ask the next one. I think you can lower them all at once. Can you do that, Lori? Oh, great. OK. OK, let's vote on the next one. Video tools and apps for the classroom. How many of you would like that as a topic? OK, this is good. You're using the tool great. This is great. OK, go ahead and clear those, Lori. Live streaming tools such as Periscope, Blab, YouTube, Livestream, Ustream. Facebook even will let you live stream now. How many of you would like that? OK, clear those. Um, PDL, uh, project-based learning projects for a subject area or any subject area. It could be all of them. How many of you would be interested in that? You have to click fast, don't you? <laughs> OK, great. Clear that. Tools and apps for differentiating for special needs students. I mean, it could be for all students, but with a particular focus on special needs students so that maybe you could learn about some new tools um, that you might not know about to help those students. Excellent. OK, clear those. Flipped learning. That could be in the classroom, or it could even be in faculty meetings, any meetings with parents, any place where you would have an opportunity to share outside of the meeting and use the meeting for discussion time. 
Ooh, that's a popular one. Okay, and that's really broad. I mean, we could cover lots of things. Okay, how about ways of using social media in the classroom? Any kind of social media. I just listed a couple, Twitter and Facebook, but it could be any of them. Blogs are certainly a, a way to use social media. Some of you use Edmodo, and that's also a form of social media. And that could be included in that. Okay, great. Okay, ed camps. What are they? What are some examples of things that you've done at ed camps and learned at ed camps? Maybe you want to plan one. What are some tips and strategies for planning and getting ready for them? And we have done a couple of webinars on ed camps in the past. Okay, and parent engagement or parent involvement strategies and stories. How about that one? Okay. Great. And I'm going to throw in that one on uh, fundraising, ideas for finding funding for technology in the classroom, maybe writing grants, that, that whole broad topic area. Okay. It's hard to decide, but you don't have to pick just one. Okay, and the final one, and then we've got to wrap up because they've run way over time. Um, how about digital badging? Uh, whether it's for students, for teachers, for parents, badges are used in so many different ways uh, to acknowledge and provide incentives for learning, like the old um, Girl Scout badges and Boy Scout badges, but now they're digital. Any of you would like to learn more about that? Great. Okay, we have that all captured in the recording. And I'll take a look and I'll get the topic posted for next week. Thank you so much for helping me with that. And Lori, you can just take us out. All right, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered together all his resources in one place including the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room for an event. As long as you make that event public, it's free. You can also nominate a featured teacher at this URL. Uh, th there's also the page inside the Resources tab in the Live Binder for the Featured Teacher of the Month. You can nominate yourself as well to be a featured teacher. When you exit the session, the survey should open up. You can take the link in the chat or in the Live Binder resource tab. As you do that, at the very bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. Make sure you use a personal email address for this rather than school, because schools tend to block this from reaching you. The recordings are available at iTunes U in audio and video formats, as well as as an RSS feed on the show's website, including the full recordings. So there are many places to get the recordings. Again, special thanks to the Madison District teachers, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show, thank you so much for coming.